Yes, good evening. My name is Sean Shapton. I'm the Executive Director for Operation Sharing. Um, I am so thrilled to be here tonight to be part of this uh, very important series as we learn and educate uh, individuals with regards to those struggling with homelessness, addiction, and mental health. So thank you for being here this evening. Thanks. Uh, my name is Stephanie uh, Ellens Clark, and I'm the Executive Director at Social <coughs> Planning Council Oxford. And we're an organization that explores and collectively works in our community to address issues that affect all of our members. So um, a lot of that exploration is around research, um, but also working together on systems level planning. Um, and I'm also here representing the Oxford Housing Action Collaborative um, as the co-chair. And that was really born out of a group of um, partner agencies knowing that no one organization can solve um, the housing crisis and that really we want to work together to ensure that all people are housed and connected in our community. Hi everyone, my name is Brooke Pickersgill and I'm an urgent needs case manager with Canadian Mental Health Association, Tams Valley Addiction and Mental Health Services. I'm primarily based out of Tilsonburg here, um, but I also do cover the Ingersoll office um, and area as well about once every two weeks. And I'm Abby Boosterd, an outreach worker with Oxford County Community Health Centre, and I work full-time out of our location here at the Tilsonburg Livingston Centre. Awesome. So I'm up first. So I hope everybody can hear me in the back. Can you hear me? Okay. So I'm going to try to set the context um, so you can really we can talk about what homelessness is so we can all be on the same page uh, but then also the causes and there's multiple causes so we're going to talk a little bit about that before we move into the resources available in our community and trying to understand the picture of what homelessness looks like in our community um, so there's been a really big shift um, over the last few years so probably when the housing cloud was started working together uh, in 2019 we heard people say there's nobody experiencing homelessness in our community and the partners around the table said well yes there is it's just what is considered hidden homelessness so often in rural communities homelessness is hidden um, but as, as we've seen through the pandemic homelessness has become a lot more <coughs> visible and a lot to do with seeing more people experiencing homelessness so I know this seems kind of a captain obvious comment at the top of what homelessness is but why I put the definition in there is because it's really important to recognize the the words stable safe and permanent and why that's key is because um, we know that there are people that are actually living in hotels and they're still considered experiencing homelessness so we want to explain to you that the picture is broader than what you're seeing um, when you think of people that are um, sleeping rough or out um, on the streets that you see so there's going to be people that are also couch surfing so I tried to um, highlight in the definition this sort of three different types of homelessness um, so when we talk about unsheltered or absolute homelessness we can think of people sleeping in their cars um, or in encampments, emergency sheltered, which Sean is going to cover quite a bit in terms of um, the services available through uh, operation sharing. Uh, but there also are people that are staying at domestic abuse services, Oxford. Um, so you're considered experiencing homelessness if you are um, staying at the shelter, which makes sense because um, if you're in an abusive situation and you leave, then uh, you need somewhere to go. You have no home. We're also chatting about people that are staying at um, Salvation Army, Army Emergency Services. So there is a family shelter available also in Woodstock. Um, and then we are also talking about provisionally accommodated. That's a big word. Basically to just say that um, you could be staying in temporary spaces and that you're, you're experiencing homelessness. So if I have to stay on my friend's couch, I'm experiencing homelessness. Or if I can't afford a place and I'm having to stay in a hotel, um, I'm almost, I'm also homeless. Um, and then there is a fourth category that you talk about, which I think is important also to think about is precariously housed. Um, so that just basically means there's people that are on the brink of homelessness. They may be one paycheck away from experiencing homelessness. They may be staying in uh, units that are not appropriate or safe. Um, and it's a very scary situation for them. So I know we were having a conversation the other day about a person who was sleeping, paying to stay in a unit that had no floors. So dirt floors, basically. So there's people that are living in situations that are not appropriate for human living. 
Um, and so this quote here um, I thought was really key to include. Um, I, I guess the people that are watching at home can't read it, so I guess I can read it for you. Um, so this was from research we did this year around displacement, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but the person experiencing homelessness said, have you ever been in a position I'm in right now? Have you been doing what I've been doing right now? You would see it completely different. No, you don't see it like that because you're at home, in your house, with your money, with your job. You don't see it like I do. <coughs> be on the street, be like us for a few months, and then come back and then tell me how you feel. It's not like we're choosing to be homeless. So we um, decided to include this quote because we really want to talk about the causes of homelessness um, and what the research says, but also what experience of folks um, living in Oxford County um, that are experiencing homelessness, the causes of why um, they got there. So <coughs> I think it's important to acknowledge, especially we're going to talk a lot about structural, um, as we see uh, the number of people experiencing homelessness in Oxford County increasing, a lot of this is connected to structural causes. So it's really important that we understand that homelessness is complex. Not all people experiencing homelessness are the same. Um, and so we have we people work with all different types of folks um, not everybody <coughs> is using drugs there are people using drugs um, some people have jobs and are experiencing homelessness um, we have older adults that are experiencing homelessness in our community um, there's family so it's a wide range of people so we wanted to include this just to say um, it is very complicated why people become homeless but also um, not being the fault of the individual. There is stigma, and I'm going to call it, um, in our community, and it's a hard thing to talk about, uh, but we wanted to put this quote up before just for you to start thinking about not to be blamey about or make you feel bad about your life situation, but to recognize that people are living in awful situations and that it doesn't help on top of that for someone to be judging them and making them feel bad. So that's why we included that. But the um, next part, structural, so um, basically what this means is um, we know that there's broad economical and social issues that are getting in the way of people's ability to make their, meet, their, meet their basic needs. So the ones that are starred here um, are actually when we did the 2020 um, Registry Week in Oxford County, um, we asked people, what was what is keeping you from having a permanent home? So of the a hundred people that responded the top three answers we actually got were the ones that are starred and that was before I mean that was the start of the pandemic but you could see that things were already starting to kind of get out of control with the housing crisis um, and we know it's just getting worse um, and so there's many examples of this as we are seeing people being displaced from their rentals um, and we've done a lot of research around this and there's policies um, in place that actually incentivize landlords to push their tenants out so that they can make more money. Um, currently a one-bedroom apartment if you look on like Kijiji and stuff, the average rental price um, for a one bedroom is around $1,670. We spoke to people when we were doing our research that we're paying $1,250 for a room. So without like a, a kitchen, basically sharing. So you have, so you think of this context and this economical piece, bigger picture that's going on. So um, in addition to other things like discrimination, um, shifts in the economy and adequate incomes. So I had some some more quotes from people but I think I won't do those for the sake of time uh, but we can share more of those and share some of the the different reports that speak to um, the system kind of issues. So I'll go to the next slide. So system failures so this is a fun one too. So you think of you have structural issues going on and then we have system failures. So um, when you think about it, it could be a transition from children's aid society. So there could be someone involved, a youth that ages out and oftentimes that can be a difficult time for someone when they age out of care around 16 or 17. Um, lack of support for veterans, um, immigrants and refugees, the support available there. Um, and then something we talked about as well, we see a lot in our community is the discharge planning. So imagine if you stay in um, 
you have to go to the hospital and you're in a unit for three weeks, say, and the psych unit, for example, and you come out and you have no place to go, what happens? Um, where are you discharged? Well, you can be discharged to homelessness. And so you can see how the system failures also connect with structural um, because we also have systems failure with housing as well. Um, so the lack of housing, but we also have large, large wait lists for um, supportive housing, which is important, and also for rent geared to income units. So it's all these kind of things piled on top of each other. The third one um, that we talk about is individual circumstances. So. It could be something that's happened to a person on a personal level um, in their family or their support system. And so you can see all the examples here, um, whether it be a traumatic event, we've talked to people that have had fires and then where do they go? Um, job loss, also something that we hear frequently, um, or personal crisis. And that's when I mentioned earlier, domestic abuse services, there can be family violence involved and where are you gonna go? We've spoken to people that actually stayed in um, their situation, in their violent situation, because of fear of, of homelessness. So you're at the point where you're like, what am I gonna do? Well, this is the choice I'm gonna make so that I, because I know I'm not gonna be able to get a, a rental at, a, at the prices that exist. Um, health issues or disabilities or problems within uh, relationships, which can include um, family members that have addictions and, and mental health pieces. So we just really wanted to share this because we wanted to, for people to understand it's very complicated and everyone you meet uh, experiencing homelessness isn't going to have the same story or the same um, kind of thing going on in their life. and being that they're people, so they have lots of different um, aspects to their life, but also they have all these structural and economic <coughs> things going on and we can all I think if you think relate in terms of prices of things right now and inflation and so imagine um, trying to pay your rent and also buy food and so I think that that was we thought it was important to consider these causes before we get into what's going on in the community so I'll pass it over to Sean. Perfect. So good evening, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me in the back. My voice is usually not a problem, um, uh, whether they like it or not sometimes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Heather and the Tilsonburg Library for this incredible and unique opportunity to share some of the uh, great work that's happening across Tilsonburg uh, and throughout Oxford County. Um, I, I usually like to lead with this slide because it brings really a different lens Housed people have the privilege of having their worst moments in private. Unhoused people don't. This gives some people the profoundly mistaken impression that the person they see acting belligerent and on the street is and will be that person every single moment of their life. Operation Sharing is uniquely positioned, whether we're dealing with individuals struggling with food insecurity or shelter insecurity, we certainly have a pulse on what's occurring across Oxford. Uh, next slide, if that's okay. Most people recognize the Inn in Woodstock. Since 2005, this was the only emergency homeless shelter across Oxford County. Uh, in uh, 2021, it only had 12 emergency shelter beds. By the end of December of this year, we will have 55 emergency shelter beds in Woodstock, and we currently have 12 beds here in Tilsonburg with a total of 67 emergency shelter beds is certainly a key indicator as of the direction that we're going, sadly. The Inn at Avondale. Uh, last February, I was able to attend a very large public meeting uh, with, I believe, over 40 attendees, ranging from many services. Um, this led down the path uh, that we were able to open up in less than four weeks. The first time ever in Oxford County, another emergency shelter, uh, not in Woodstock. Uh, Avondale Church was, is an incredible partner. We're beyond thankful for their generosity and their willingness to be a willing host. Some of the, the pieces that we learned through the first meeting and several past that was that Tilsonburg was experiencing something they hadn't before. And the realities of homelessness, mental health and addiction leads to some, some very public issues that are perhaps new to some. If you're from Woodstock, as I mentioned, this really is Woodstock about five years ago and some of the pieces that we're seeing. Throughout the trial date, which uh, we opened on March 1st, 2023, and we closed April 16th, 2023 for a total of 47 days, we are a 12-bed facility. 
um, each night and I would really like to recognize Patrick from the mill. Patrick donates a meal every single night at no cost to our guests there. Uh, we have two sh uh, staff per shift. Uh, we open at 7 p.m. and we close at 8.30 a.m. Uh, part of the funding came from the Thames Valley Family Health Team and the reason that we went that route is because of your unique position. I wasn't sure what county we were going to get folks so I didn't want to dabble with just Oxford County funding so we created a unique opportunity to really see the true result. We had a total of 418 stays out of a possible 564 if we were full each night. One of the greatest pieces was we were able to make 64 community connections in six weeks. We had two unique uh, visitors, one from Scarborough and one from Mexico. Um, and we were able to connect them with folks to move them on to the appropriate services. On November 1st, I was very excited to announce that we are now a six month facility here in Tilsonburg. Again, incredible thanks to Avondale uh, United Church for really taking an opportunity um, to, to look at the situation and to recognize where we're at. Um, to my surprise, we have been full most nights, um, ranging at an average of 10, leaving only two shelter beds. I was there last night and we were full by 8.15. There is no doubt that there are a lot of opinions uh, with regards to homelessness, addiction, and mental health. And that's why I apply to everyone for taking an opportunity to learn more about the struggles that our folks uh, go through each and every day. Whether you look at their addiction and think, my goodness, I would never do that, or maybe you look at an individual pushing a cart down the street and think, oh, how dare they? They may look different, they might dress different, they might even smell different, but it doesn't make them any less human than anyone in this room tonight. I am beyond proud of the work that my staff leads each and every day as individuals show up to us in circumstances far beyond what anyone or most people in this room could even believe what we're faced with. We do it with a level of dignity and kindness because that's really what matters. The bottom line for us is this is someone's son or daughter or mom or dad, grandma or grandpa, and for us, that's really the, the reality of what we're dealing with. There is no set demographic. There certainly is a, a defined larger population. However, senior citizens, those being released from hospital, as Stephanie mentioned a minute ago, without a plan, is one of the biggest struggles we're facing right now. As I look to the growth in, ta in Tilsonburg uh, and think where are we going to go, I've already begun some very light discussions to see if there is room to grow the facility here in Tilsonburg to meet the growing and ever-changing needs of what's occurring right across Oxford. Uh, operation sharing is predominantly funded through the County of Oxford and we are very thankful for their, their support. Um, there's no doubt there's a long way to go. And when I look at the opportunities that we have to in improve someone's life, if for some it might just be a simple smile or a warm hello, but kindness always matter. And for someone who works very closely with the homeless population, I can tell you that um, they have hopes and dreams just like everyone. For some of our guests, we have to go a little bit further back to draw those pieces out. Uh, we do sometimes through art therapy, whether it's through just a regular conversation, it might happen at two in the morning, that's totally okay, a staff is awake and, and ready to entertain that. But I can't stress, I know it's hard, I know that everyone is feeling that pressure in this community. Uh, I have spent a significant amount of time here uh, working with the OPP as a wonderful partner um, and trying to learn where the encampments are, who are the individuals that are struggling with that, uh, that this, these lifestyle choices. And as much as I use the word choice very lightly, that is a reality that there are very few choices for individuals struggling with mental health, addiction, and homelessness. So perhaps living in an encampment is their only choice. And sometimes supporting that, even though it's something very different than we may choose in this room, is still okay. So at this point, I will turn it over to, um, I'm not sure who's next, but, uh, and I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Sean. Just before I get started on some of our community resources that Brooke and I will touch on, I do just want to echo the thanks that Sean put out to Avondale Church and to Operation Sharing as well to be able to offer the shelter here in Tilsonburg for the last few years. And I'll talk a little bit about what Brooke and I do in our street outreach. 
but uh, prior to having a shelter here, our, our only option was to have individuals go to Woodstock. And I would say the majority of folks would say to us, we know that's available and we just want to stay home. This is their home community. This is where they felt safe. This is where they may have a few friends or families or the odd couch here or there that they might be able to sleep on. Um, many individuals were still trying to hold down part-time or full-time employment. And so though we were, we were grateful that we had the shelter in Woodstock, it just wasn't realistic for some of our individuals who live in Tilsonburg and this is home and you know they may only have um, uh, small connections to the community this was still their community so I can say as a provider who offers um, direct services to individuals here in Tilsonburg we are so very grateful for Avondale and for Operation Sharing Sean so thank you for for making that happen in such a quick time because it truly has made such a difference in so many folks lives here. So Brooke and I are going to talk a little bit about community resources. Um, we did just want to highlight to folks that we do have services and support here in Tilsonburg. And you know, just as we say to the individuals that we're connected with, we don't know what we don't know. And so oftentimes what we do hear, it, do hear from folks is there's not enough, and you're right, there's not enough. I mean, could we expand our services and, and support here? Absolutely. But we did want to let folks know that we do have really great things happening here in Tilsonburg. So I'll start with the mobile health outreach bus and it's a little bit unique in Tilsonburg that we don't physically have the bus here. So the language that we use, typically I would say use, is street outreach. So every Wednesday from 11 to 3, Brooke and I are out um, downtown. You'll see us with our backpacks. Typically we're in the downtown core, so outside of the mall. We spend time in the library. In the afternoons we're at Helping Hand Food Bank. We do underground parking, Avondale Church area. So we have a little bit of a route that we typically do every week and folks definitely know where and how to connect with us so we would have started this the beginning of the pandemic and um, as we say it took a lot of cups of tea to make relationships and to meet people and it wasn't very long that we started coming out consistently that we would actually have people waiting for us down in front of the mall saying oh we were just waiting for you girls to come um, so fast forward uh, I guess four years later and we've actually just recently expanded our street outreach to Monday afternoons as well so the beginning of November every Monday afternoon from 1.30 to 3.30 you can find us out um, doing our outreach as well. We are super fortunate that we work very closely with organizations here in Tilsonburg. So Brooke and I are consistently out every Wednesday and then every other Wednesday we have either someone from um, our housing team at Oxford County Community Health Centre or Human Services through Oxford County. And on Monday afternoons we have someone from CMHA and on the weeks we don't have CMHA we also have a human service worker from the county. So not only are we out there with our backpacks handing out snacks and drinks, um, socks, toques, scarves, basic hygiene items, but we're also there to connect with people, to advocate, to try to make sure that they are connected to services if appropriate, if they choose to. Sometimes it's meeting people who don't have access to a phone, so we're making phone calls with them, making doctor's appointments, connecting them to um, perhaps their court worker, Sometimes it's advocating to ODSP, Ontario Works. Um, but what we do know and what we have found is for individuals who may not be successful in keeping appointments or don't have the ability to make appointments because they don't have access to email or phones, that they have come to know that they can find us out weekly um, to try to help navigate the system in order to get them the appointments or the support that they need. Um, so that's a little bit about outreach and again at the end there will be opportunity for questions or Brooke and I will be around after that you can ask if you have specific questions. And then our housing stability team, I need to do a little shout out to United Way. Thank you, Kelly, a huge funder of the housing stability team at Oxford County Community Health Centre. We have housing workers that offer support across Oxford County. Um, Deidre is our intake worker. So if anyone is looking to get connected to our housing team, it would be a call to Deidre. And then the appointments for Tilsonburg residents are made at the Livingston Centre. So again, trying to remove all barriers in terms of transportation. I do often like to be very upfront with folks to say as much as we like to think that our housing stability team has a magic wand we don't so we can't we don't necessarily have um, you know uh, 
inventory in our back pocket, but we do have a really great team who helps a lot with pre with eviction prevention. So if there's one thing that we really try to share with community is that if someone receives an eviction notice to please get connected with our team. Um, unfortunately, tenants aren't always aware of their rights and sometimes we know that these eviction notices are coming and they're not necessarily um, done properly. So if anyone's interested in connecting with housing stability or eviction prevention directly, I can provide that information <coughs> after. And um, more recently in the spring of this year, we were also very fortunate that United Way partnered with us to offer a transitional house here in Tilsonburg. So we have a beautiful home that is a home for seven individuals that provides them a year to um, get connected to resources, to work with our housing team on site to then find more permanent housing. So again, thanks to United Way for the beautiful home and, um, and that's a, a new exciting program that we can now say is offered here in Tilsonburg as well as Woodstock. And then just to highlight some of our community resources that are offered um, throughout the community, community table through Cycles of Life is in Tilsonburg every Thursday at the Upper Deck Youth Center from 11 to 1, no appointment needed. You don't have to have ID, there's no eligibility criteria. Uh, we're fortunate that Cycles works with the Rotary Club here in Tilsonburg, a great group of volunteers where folks can present and just let the volunteers know what it is they need. So there's always access to food there as well as clothing items, specifically warm winter items at this time of year as well. The Helping Hand Food Bank, um, which is by appointment only, but folks can make appointments and access the food bank uh, at a maximum of twice a month. Their food appointments are on Wednesday afternoons, which is also why we chose to be out Wednesdays for our street outreach, that then we have the opportunity to connect with folks who are utilizing the food bank. Folks can also present to the food bank on Wednesdays if they don't have an appointment and ask for an emergency bag. So the difference is an emergency bag, they literally get one or two bags of food. If they have an appointment, they would leave with a substantial amount of food. Um, but just for, for individuals to know that you don't need an appointment, you still can present. Um, we also try to suggest appointments just because you'll, you'll, uh, you'll leave with more food than, than an emergency bag. The Fel Salvation Army um, Family Services offers a wide range of services, so they do have emergency food. They have their Salvation Army Wellness Program, which helps individuals for anything medical or wellness related that might not be affordable to them. They can sometimes help with transportation, and right now they're offering their Christmas hampers as well. St. Vincent de Paul also has emergency food as well as some funding for um, hydro or bills that individuals might not be able to, um, to pay. That is a service that's run by volunteers, so I do like to tell individuals if they call the number, they will not get a live person. It will be voicemail. They leave their name and phone number and a volunteer will call back within, within the day of their voicemail being left. And then as Sean already um, mentioned, we were happy to, to share that the inn is now open until May 1st and open every night with, um, with a warm meal from the mill as well. Awesome. So in addition to some of the resources that Abby has already highlighted, we also have a couple others to touch base with. Um, so there's community meals offered throughout Tilsonburg weekly. So kind of the three regular ones are in the like community dinner, which is Sundays at 5 p.m. at the Upper Deck Youth Center. Uh, Fridays at 6.15, uh, there's open doors meal and that's at Faith Church. And then Saturdays at 11.30, there's a meal offered at St. Paul's United Church. So these, are meal these meals are free of charge and available to anyone. Um, so we like to just remind people that it's not just for those that are um, kind of in need of some food security, but also just for community members wanting to maybe go out, get out and get social or meet other people in the community. Um, so those are open. And then there's also um, Oxford County Talking Counseling Services. So this program offers immediate access to counseling services free of charge without any referrals needed. Um, so here in Tilsonburg, that's offered out of the CMHA building, which is just on Broadway. Um, and it's offered Mondays from 12 to 7. So any age can access this. Um, there's no kind of... There's no, you don't need to you know, have any diagnoses or anything. Any, it's open to absolutely anyone. And all you need to do is call the number there on the screen and generally you're booked in within a week. I'm back. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make a couple of points. Uh, there's no way that Operation Sharing would be able to complete all of this work on our own. 
um, sitting up here so fortunate uh, I get to work along such incredible folks uh, and including my team um, for anyone that uh, is on the front line trying to work through these issues there doesn't seem like there's an end in sight right now so it's the work that we do is hard and I would like to acknowledge everyone who's leading this at these efforts because your work is important and we're all thankful for those efforts um, uh, Maybe there's someone in this room, David Mayberry, who probably attend, <laughs> attended a AMO um, and, and heard an incredible um, reflection by Dr. Andrew Babick Boozeri, who said, we are stacking the cards against people and then blaming them for bad health outcomes when they fail. We are choosing as a society and government to spend billions on roads while thousands don't have a home. By no means do I envy anyone that is in local government these days. It's hard and it's going to be harder. However, when you look at the work that's happening across Oxford, it is truly incredible. Although some, some days are harder to find positive moments, there is no doubt that the end goal and the outcomes can be wonderful. We become their family. We become the resources that they look for, whether it's one day a week or every day a week um, in the communities. I wanted to share with you a story uh, of an individual that uh, I'll just use his first name as Norman. I shared this at County Council a few months ago, uh, an incredible young man who died four times in our space. Norman overdosed four times at Operation Sharing in Woodstock. He has given me complete permission, by the way, to tell this story. He would prefer to be here and be up there, but um, for reasons that you can all imagine, we aren't quite there in his journey. Norman's story is not uh, unlike many. Uh, he fell into hard times after having a very successful start to his life. When Norman began to, to dabble using drugs, he was still fully employed. He still had full contact with his children and his family, and unfortunately that all disappeared very quickly. Sliding into a life of homelessness, struggling with mental health and addiction is one of the hardest pieces to rise up and out of. The last day, the last time Norman overdosed in our space, we, my staff quickly realized we, this was our opportunity. He refused to go by ambulance, so we brought him into the office and we laid it on the line. I was not prepared to make a call that I've made too many times to families expressing our condolences to our guests that pass away. At Operation Sharing, we're uniquely positioned because when a guest does pass, pass away, we sometimes have had wonderful moments that families have forgotten about during those times. So when I make those calls, and I'm able to share or send artwork or a wonderful heartwarming story, I wasn't prepared to do that with Norman and I'm not prepared to do it with any other guests. Within 48 hours, we had Norman on a train with his first leg headed to Toronto. There was a few legs to this trip, so we made sure he had food. He had all of the things he needed, some clean clothes. And two and a half hours later, he called me and said that he missed his connecting train. A little bit dramatic in the moment, uh, I'm not going to lie, I quickly reacted with my team and we were able to get uh, three phones going. We, were, we got him connected to his next leg. We were able to Uber him some food due to technology and he waited patiently. Unfortunately, when he arrived in Montreal after the second leg, because of the delays of that train, he missed his third leg. Through a magical amount of time and thanks to so many staff who I called at 11.30 at night on a Friday night, to my wife who had two phones going, to every hotel in Montreal because trying to get someone into a hotel room without identification is nearly impossible. At the 10th hotel that we called, I told them that I had to get my nephew home because my father was passing away. A little white lie that I will never regret. Um, we were able to get uh, some photocopied ID sent over that sort of resembled Norman and they approved the identification. Um, in fact, I received a lovely call about 20 minutes after Norman checked in expressing our deepest condolences in the loss of my father. Um, with that, I'm really pleased to say that Norman is over 250 days sober. I talk to Norman twice every single day, morning and night, and every time I say it, you'll hear my voice shake a little. Um, he's an incredible man who is working two jobs. He's reconnected with family. He is reconnected with resources that he needs, and he talks to his kids every single day. If it's possible for Norman, it's possible for any of our guests. It's important to remember that although these outcomes aren't common, unfortunately, 
when they do happen, we need to really utilize the paths that we took to get there. Although they may not be conventional, it may not be A, B, C, D, it could be D, 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 A, B, A, K, K L, who knows, but we get there. And I'm really proud of Norman, he knows that, I tell him that every day. Um, and, and I want the public to realize that these individuals are incredible. There's no doubt I've learned far more from those that have nothing than those that have everything. And there's no way that our guests will ever learn as much from me as I've learned from them. So we'll move forward, sorry, slide. Um, and this is the day space in Woodstock. Unfortunately, at this point, we aren't quite there in Tilsonburg, but this is one of the most important goals is to wrap folks up so that when they leave our space at Avondale at 8 or 8.30 in the morning, they have somewhere else to go, not just on the streets. Next slide, yeah. For many in this room, looking at these pictures, you may think that it is impossible that people live there. I can tell you emphatically that people live there and some live there quite happily. Um, Operation Sharing is the one of the co-leaders of the ERT team, the encampment response team. Um, and when we go out into the encampments, we always encourage people to make sure that they know the resources that are available, the incredible work that the Oxford County Community Health Center does, the mobile health bus that is on site, um, ensuring that they're well taken care of, and of course, Operation Sharing and the services we provide. As I mentioned earlier, looking at this and recognizing that this is still a choice. For individuals that have very few things that they can choose in their life, it's okay to make a choice. Although I don't encourage it, to be honest, I would rather them come to our facility where I know they're warm and safe from all of the worries that they may feel. We still welcome and acknowledge that that's okay. With that, I give great thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight and I will pass it over for the last time to someone else. Okay, so before we get into questions, we just thought we would put up some ideas for taking action if you're interested. Something that I think um, connects to probably what everyone has said so far is also we should add be kind. Um, and I think that kind of somewhat connects with be a voice for change and speak up and reduce stigma. So that's a key piece um, for people to take away. Um, if you do hear people saying things um, to try to help um, with debunking myths or things you've learned today. So that connects with educate yourself. Coming here tonight um, is part of the taking action, right? Um, is to learn more, to understand the supports available in our community. Um, there are a lot of resources if you want to read more. Um, uh, and as this is a library, uh, Heather uh, was like, what book should we put? So we put up some books. Um, these slides will be available. Uh, but a lot of these um, actually focus on people um, telling their stories or so that you can get a sense and you can learn um, different aspects of um, how people experience homelessness. So whether someone has an addiction or whether someone, ha you know, all the different situations. Um, and then the, I added from the ashes on there as well. Uh, because that comes from an indigenous person's perspective about homelessness and there's actually a different definition for homelessness related for indigenous folks in Canada um, and then there's a couple in there that are a little more systems focused um, the tenant class is a really good book um, to consider if you're trying to understand what's going on in the current um, housing market and um, sort of tenant market um, the other piece we put was advocate um, to speak up and, and chat with um, your local politicians. Um, there are opportunities to join letter writing campaigns. I put one in here um, as an example, say yes to fair rents. So this is through ACTO. Um, so basically there's, it's a, a thing, a provincial group that's trying to um, advocate the provincial government around putting vacancy control and rent controls back in place. Um, and then we also have donate time, experience, and or money. So if you want to get involved, there's a number of local um, resources and charities that you can get involved with, whether that be donating your time <coughs> as a volunteer or your expertise. Um, and also the group wanted to note there are a number of different fundraisers and you can fund different agencies, but also the coldest night of the year is coming up on November, for February 24th. Um, I did also write down, 
that we really hope that you can use the information that you've learned today but we are also all very friendly people um, that would love to chat more um, there's many resources available that you can and you can learn more about and have conversations with us um, but there are great things happening like Sean said in the community um, we did I think a number of us brought some different resources with us um, we have some different reports that we've written on displacement if you're interested and some uh, magnet things about um, some tenant support that you can get and I think Abby might also have some mm -hmm. some materials so please connect with us so I don't know Heather if you're gonna moderate the questions now uh, sure yeah well before we move into questions I would just like to say a big thank you again to our panelists this evening let's give them a round of applause <laughs> I would also like to send a thank you and acknowledgement to Shanda Whitman of Oxford County Human Services. She was supposed to be on our panel this evening, but unfortunately she was ill. Um, I would also like to say a big thank you to Kelly Gilson from United Way, Kelly Block of Human Services, Sandy Dobachevsky from CMHA, Patty Monahan from CMHA, and the countless individuals throughout the county who are doing amazing things for those experiencing homelessness and who have helped kind of derive this community series. So thank you. Okay. If, if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand. What's the current magnitude of homelessness in Tilson Road? So that was going to be what Shanda was going to cover, so I had the notes. <laughs> um, and we were just talking about this before, so if you remember um, what we I had on the slide about the different types of homelessness, um, we, d we can't tell you the exact number, um, but we do have what is called the by name list. Um, so those are folks that uh, give their consent to be on a list um, so that then they can be helped with different supports and be um, put into ha to housing and different things. Um, so that's not a complete picture. So I can tell you um, as of November on the by name list, so as Sean and I were chatting about, there's going to be new numbers for December, um, that there were 109 people across Oxford County on the by name list and 22 um, said that are active on the list said they prefer to be housed in Tilsonburg or that they're from this community. Um, and we have a bit more of a breakdown, but so 22 uh, according to the binding list, but we understand that it's bigger than that um, because of when you think of the hidden pieces or the people that aren't on that list. And is there any estimate of the unknown number? No, I don't believe so. And I think there's, I don't really think there's like a formula or a way to, to figure that out. When you think of people staying in motels, people staying on couches, I mean, I imagine probably a few of us could even reflect and think of people we know or people ourselves have had experiences, right? So when you're not, you're not sure where to go and you're on a couch. So I think, I don't know that there is a way to get that information or make estimates about it. Uh, how often are people turned down? So there's 67 beds? How many nights would there be overflow or people that can't be? Yeah, so <coughs> currently uh, there is only um, 30 beds in Woodstock. We are in the middle of a renovation at Old St. Paul's, so we don't have 67 beds yet. Uh, I can tell you currently we turn away anywhere from 4 to 15 people a night in Woodstock. At Avondale, I believe there's only been two evenings where we've turned people away. Um, however, we recognize that the the significant growth is, of course, the largest center in Oxford, which is Woodstock. Um, but yeah, we are turning individuals away each night. And of those people that stay there, are many children, or is it all for only adults? So we are not um, children, family, shelter services. That's handled through the Salvation Army. Um, we only handle adults. So the lowest age that we can accept is 16 years old, uh, up to a question mark of however old they arrive at. Any, any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Operation Sharing is uh, mm -hmm. supported by uh, County of Oxford, is mm -hmm. that correct? 
is yes so the question was sorry I'll just repeat that really. the question was our funding um, asking if we are supported by from funding standpoint from Oxford County and yes it's the this past year has about been about 50% from the County of Oxford and 50% private funding so private funding if we wanted to make a donation mm -hmm. that would be a tax tax uh, Deductible? Absolutely it would. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. Yeah. Yes. Um, you listed there that uh, people could volunteer. How, would, how do you fit volunteers into your operation? So the question was, um, how do we fit volunteers into our operation? Um, at Operation Sharing, I have a hard and fast rule that we do not allow volunteers in the shelter space due to the um, issues that may arise. I don't want to have staff worrying about a volunteer mm -hmm. while they have things happening over here with guests that really need their help. We always allow um, volunteers uh, in Woodstock at uh, our sharing table restaurant and Food for Friends and of course through our seasonal programs, uh, coats and boots for uh, kids and families and of course the Christmas place. And I think it would be similar with other community agencies um, that would also take volunteers and of all the ones that Abby mentioned, Absolutely. a number of them will yeah. be looking for volunteers for the various programs. So if you want to check out 211, I looked at <laughs> Kelly and I thought of it. Um, so we do have a service 211, you can um, phone it or you can also look on the website that lists all the different services in our community and so there also is a um, you would get a sense of the services and there is also a website volunteer in Oxford um, that you can check out that organizations post um, if they're looking for a specific position but that doesn't mean obviously that you need to go through that you can just call people or <laughs> show up to any other questions yes. do you know is there do you know how many the number of encampments that are in Woodstock and are there in Tilsonburg you want me to take this so the question was, uh, um, are we aware of the number of encampments uh, virtually across Oxford? Yes, I would say that we are. Um, I believe right now in Woodstock, uh, there are 14 active encampments. Um, in Ingersoll, there's two to three. And in uh, Tilsonburg, to the best of my knowledge, there's one that is quite significant. Yeah. How, how many people live in the Tilsonburg one? Uh, so the question was how many people live in the Tilsonburg encampment it really varies um, I haven't been out since the snow started to fly um, November was not really indicative of cold weather we had 15 mm -hmm. to 20 degree weather um, which was much more conducive to living in an encampment so probably next week when I head back out I'll have a much better idea but I can say through the summer months it would range anywhere from 6 to 14 depending on the time and of course you're not always there when the individuals are there so that number uh, may not be an exact science either do we have any stats on of the homeless how many are the, just on the verge that just can't afford rent versus mental health drug addiction issues that have been there for years and years and just perpetual homeless um, so the, the question is do we have statistics on or numbers on those that are just struggling financially uh, versus those that are struggling with mental health and addiction um, I'll be honest I don't think you can really separate them anymore uh, they are all, all, all three of them are so intertwined however we are as I mentioned earlier we're uniquely positioned because we offer uh, food insecurity programs through food for friends and our sharing table along with uh, operating the only homeless shelters in Oxford we see that thin what we used to call the thin line is disappearing um, those that are struggling are really on a threshold that they can bounce back and forth mm -hmm. I think the difference with those struggling with mental health and addiction versus those that are having some economic struggles is the resources that are made available to them um, most still have connections to families or are able to navigate a difficult system to navigate no matter whether you're struggling with mental health and addiction or not um, but that would be probably the biggest definition we don't see a lot of individuals coming to our organization that aren't um, in a you know a mental health or addiction crisis I would say when they reach that level um, many bridges have been burned along the way so 
I think it's also just important to note for those who are receiving social assistance, so whether that's um, ODSP, CPPD, CPP Disability or Ontario Works, what they are receiving a month will not cover accommodation. And that's just the basic rent. So what they're receiving will not cover rent. That's not, you know, thinking about if they don't have an all-inclusive unit or a phone bill or food or heaven forbid if they just want to go for dinner or grab a coffee. So, I mean, I think that that's also what we're seeing as well is those individuals who are receiving um, Ontario Works, ODSP, even seniors, so whether it's OAS or um, Canadian Pension Plan, it just isn't enough to meet the, the demand of accommodation, um, not to mention anything else. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the other thing about the fine line of how it all blurs together, um, when we did the displacement research recently, there was a huge piece around the impact of going through that experience of being displaced. So when we talk about displacement, meaning like you're pushed out of your unit. Um, and so as we see that rise, people, that causes mental health issues mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. um, because of that trauma of oftentimes being threatened or by the landlord or um, some of the other things we heard, um, like these little subtle things that someone might do to you. So um, I think there there is a connection for sure, but they may not get to the point where they're um, needing to access the shelter, although um, there are people that do um, have to access the shelter as well. But you're right, if they've burnt bridges, um, they're going to probably be there versus if they um, haven't burnt the bridges, they might be still couch surfing. So they're still experiencing homelessness or in a hotel, still experiencing homelessness. Kelly, you were going to say something? Uh, first of all, I just <coughs> want to thank all of you uh, and Heather in the library as well for putting this on because I think it's so important to show it truly takes a village. Mm -hmm. There is no one organization, there is no one group, there is no one program. It takes a village to help and you are the village and you're doing, um, each of you, amazing things. And then I was going to actually just follow um, up as specifically on as an example what someone living on, say, ODSP uh, lives on, and you just touched on that, Abby, mm -hmm. for sure, but, mm -hmm. but maybe for context, you could tell people what, what someone who is deemed unable to work to support themselves for, for medical reasons, what do they receive a month? So I think it was just up. It was 1265, um, but I believe that the new number is 1338. I want to say somewhere around that, um, and that is the max amount amount you can get. Now, if individuals are unhoused, they do not get that full portion. They don't get the shelter uh, allowance. They just get basic needs. I'm not sure what that is, but it's significantly less. Um, I don't know if anyone else has that number. I believe it's 745.50. The shelter portion is 556. Okay, so mm -hmm. the shelter portion is 556 if anyone didn't hear that. So, so as, a, as reference, yep. nowhere virtually is there a place that is available to live for that amount. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, although we also have some great, deeply affordable providers in the room. Um, <laughs> Indwell would be a perfect example, mm -hmm. but uh, sadly, there's just not enough units to try and, and meet that demand. But I think it was just important for reference point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a friend, uh, she's homeless and she has two dogs, so she, she, can't, she thinks she can't go to the shelter, is that true? So the question was, do we allow pets in the shelter system? So we... Yeah, uh, so that's a, a big piece and we are seeing a, a large increase with individuals with pets. Um, currently we are making accommodations to allow for pets. In Tilsonburg we're waiting for um, some cages to come in because we do have to have parameters put in place for How safety. I find out when these cages are ready? So, so we, it'll be up on our, uh, on our Facebook page and on our website. And your operation sharing? Operation sharing, yep. Yeah. Alright. Yeah, okay. so. Uh, it, again, I should stress that uh, there are some questions based as on seeing numbers rise. Uh, we have a role and a duty to keep everyone safe. Um, so having five dogs in a, in a space is, is not exactly easy. Um, so uh, we are, but we will always try and make every accommodation to accept individuals. Uh, yes, at the back. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering with the outreach, is there a health component to that at all? Like, do you have places you can refer people for health care, or are we providing any sort of 
health care for these people in the community? That's a really great question. So when we first received the funding for the mobile health outreach bus, um, it was actually to include a nurse practitioner. So for our first year on the road, we had an NP out with us across Oxford. It was amazing to be able to, it was her name's Jen. It was amazing to be able to work with Jen. She would be able to see people literally in the streets. She'd hop on the bus, fire up the laptop, send the script over and say, you know, you can go over to Cowards and, and pick it up. Unfortunately, our funding was not continued after our pilot project. Having said that, as community partners, we recognized that we could not pull the service back for the mobile health outreach bus. So we are still offering it in Woodstock. There is still the medical component. So there's an NPR registered nurse that goes out. Um, in Tilsonburg, we don't have that consistent. So we did have one of our nurses join us to offer flu shot clinic at the Helping Hand Food Bank. But in terms of weekly presence of primary care, unfortunately, we don't offer that. In saying that, we do our best to try to get folks connected so to make sure that um, they are aware of the urgent care clinic at uh, the medical center in the mall to make sure that if we're if we're aware of open rosters to get them connected um, sometimes it is that advocacy piece and then we try to figure out the transportation after the fact so as you all know there's um, there's a huge gap in service here locally and across Oxford um, so we do our best with what we have yeah, I thought I had read that you did have an NPR. Yes, yeah. Uh, is the Ministry of Health involved with helping at all? Because this is a public health issue. If I believe that housing, lack of housing. <laughs> yeah, everyone's uh, looking at each other. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'll let someone else take that to start. So. There have been, uh, so the, I should talk about the Ontario, the Oxford Health team and maybe you can add on to that. So I do believe the Oxford Health team has some components related to housing, but I think they're still trying to figure that out. But I don't think there's any direct funding. Um, mm -hmm. There are fundings for mental health supports. Um, but there's not a lot so and that's not intended to be there's some advocacy that needs to be done and we have talked about this um, a lot of the mental health services in Oxford are actually funded by United Way um, and so there's that aspect of trying to build the case for the need for for example mental health supports to be covered by funding from the healthcare system um, so I'm not answering the question well. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that. And honestly, Steph, I don't. I don't think that I'm in a position where I could speak to that further either. Like I know our funding for um, the Oxford County Community Health Center is from Ministry of, of um, Health and Long Term Care. So I guess indirectly, but in terms of homelessness specifically, I I don't have the yeah, capacity to so speak the, to that. And the funding provided for, um, for example, the housing stability team is through then reaching home federal dollars not health care dollars I see that Natasha's waving because there are some um, recently announcements uh, for some dollars from the health care sector for supportive housing and I don't know if you want to speak to that Natasha well I was just gonna name like it's quite complex because it's a combination of um, sectors mm -hmm. uh, so you have uh, housing and infrastructure sector and you have the health sector and getting these ministries to work collaboratively I think Steph you did a great job highlighting like the challenges uh, the structural the system mm -hmm. the systematic stuff mm -hmm. um, and then the advocacy to MPs and MPPs to say these actually aren't separate pieces they are so intertwined mm -hmm. um, and I think that there is some movement in that direction to recognize that health and housing um, go hand in hand and mm -hmm. speak to the social determinants of health mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. um, Are there any other questions? Yes. I noticed a big topic on social media today, mm -hmm. early this morning, was about the warming station. Mm -hmm. Is there only the one in Tilsonburg? 
So as far as I'm aware, um, Town of Tilsmer just announced this week that Tilsmer Community Centre will be our warming station. Um, hours of operation for the warming station is 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. So the good news is folks who are utilizing the inn can leave shelter and um, make their way over to the community centre and they are able to stay there until, until 10 p.m. Now, in, I, it hasn't been publicly announced, but I will also maybe turn that over to Heather as well, that I know many individuals <coughs> that we connect with when we're doing our street outreach also are utilizing space here at the library. Yes. Yeah. 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 I would deem the library to also be a warming station. Yeah. If there was a dream facility, uh, <laughs> what would it look like? address that to me first oh, time. Yeah. So the question was if there was a dream facility what would it look like? Um, there is no doubt in my mind we have to make this easier for individuals struggling with mental health and addiction. Uh, there is a lot of different opinions. Uh, my opinion I'm going to stress will be very different than some other panelists up here. I believe that we need a standalone facility with all services in it. Communal living for me will always be paramount because putting someone who is addicted and struggling with mental health alone is not safe. Um, I can tell you the enormous amount of lives that we have saved because people are laying eyes on our guests. You know, it's very different when you are in a, a, men a different mental state or your addiction, you're working with methadone or suboxone to, to ease those cravings. Um, for our guests or those that are truly, truly struggling, uh, communal living, bar none, is the safest measure. I will never be a supporter of putting human beings in garden sheds. Um, that is, that is a, a piece for me that I think is emphatic. We can do far better across Oxford County um, and our resources are unlimited. So for me, a large standalone facility that has all the services required, including help if you determine that you're ready to go to rehabilitation, including help if today isn't your best day and everything along the way from some therapy groups. This is not, this, the complexities of homelessness, mental health and addiction will far outweigh what we're gonna cover this evening. But I think the solutions has to be, and I see Mr. Mayberry sitting there and I know he's listening intently, has to be humanity over dollars. There is bar none, no way out of this unless we're going to start spending some money. We are in a point where we're beyond the term crisis. In fact, I think crisis is so overused that we are completely numb to its effects anymore. What we are seeing come through our doors is not easy and it's harder and harder. So making it easier for our guests that, and clients that show up, I would love to be able to wrap them up and say, go here on the second floor and we can help with this issue today. Mm -hmm. I think the hard thing too is like the, continuum right so because um, your question was about the one thing or the what a building would look like um, I think there's also the other aspect of prevention and eviction prevention that was touched on but also um, when we think of affordable housing which I know the county is working on building units um, but we know we're lacking units for people to go to so it's it's a number of solutions together so the building but plus um, you know can we build permanent supportive housing more of that um, so people can have their needs met and be able to move out of homelessness as well um, so I think it's like a it's a number of solutions together and that's I think the part that makes it so frustrating um, is that there is no just one answer right there's multiple solutions um, and working all of us trying to to work on those kind of all at the same time which is the fun part um, because we really want to make sure that people can move out of homelessness or prevent them from even having to experience go through this horrible situation right mm -hmm. and i would agree with steph i, I mean i think that um as much as we can dream it's a very unique situation for every individual and what's going to work best for them so we know and we've um, we've definitely seen in both our transitional house in Woodstock and in Tilsonburg that is a very successful model um, the shelter is a very successful model for some individuals where they are on that continuum specific to Tilsonburg right now if someone said I have a money tree and what can we make happen tomorrow I truly feel like 
a day space. So what Sean spoke about in Woodstock, we do not have a place for individuals to hang out, to spend time, to be safe during the day. So we have the warming stations, um, which is which is great. And I'm like I said, I'm happy that that was announced this week. But as of last week, if you were to be out on the street with us, these individuals have their suitcases, they have their bags. Folks who are utilizing the shelter every day are not able to leave their stuff at shelter. Um, we have many individuals who unfortunately are might be banned from different um, facilities in Tilsonburg. So in the summer, I remember uh, one individual who we were quite close with and I kept, I was worried about her being dehydrated. And she finally said to me, Abby, stop telling me to drink. I have nowhere to go to the washroom. And I was like, you have nowhere to go to the washroom because unfortunately the few public places um, she was banned from at those time. So I mean, for me right now, immediately, what would be beneficial for the community would be a day space. Would it solve all of the problems? Absolutely not. But would it give them a place that they would be warm, that they can charge their devices in an ideal world? If it had laundry and shower facilities, that would be amazing. That's a huge gap right now. Um, but that's that's just my my opinion in terms of what we hear, uh, you know, day to day on the street. I feel like that would be one of the the more immediate needs. Yeah. Just to echo what Abby's saying, the shower and the laundry is a huge gap right now for individuals in Tilsonburg. There's nowhere for them to go. So even if I mean the shelter is great and they have somewhere warm to stay overnight, but they can't shower. They have nowhere to do their laundry. Um, and Woodstock, they're lucky to have that. Unfortunately, we don't have that yet here. And I know there's lots of reasons why, but that's a huge gap that we have. And when we just think about, you know, having a shower is something that I, I know I obviously have taken for granted. And we have one individual who we're, we're quite um, closely connected with. He's very motivated. Um, he, I would say he's he's new to being homeless or sleeping rough. This has not been um, been a pattern or a history has an appointment actually tomorrow with employment services is very very motivated to land employment and he will often ask the question like where do I shower before I go to an interview or when I don't have an address to put on my resume as soon as folks see that like my my resume is going in the garbage where can I pack my lunch in the morning so it's those little things in terms of you know when I think that's part of the stigma too is is oftentimes we hear well you know everyone's uh, hiring why don't they just go get a job I mean <coughs> if only it were that easy right and so these are when we think about the shower and laundry it is it is impacting every aspect of their life so, right. yeah so do you have like numbers that people can say okay if for that instance you can come to my house and get ready for a job interview or something like that you know, I have like a list of that would be people that would be, be really lovely that, if we did I no? uh, right now we we don't if anyone wants to volunteer, we're happy yeah. to take names and numbers. <laughs> we're friendly. <laughs> All the resources. Yeah, we for someone to come in and shower, right. get ready for an interview with Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I think that's the stigma is everybody's stigma. homeless is on drugs. So Absolutely. Right. You're asking, yeah. I would not mind also when come in if I knew they are getting ready for a job, but mm -hmm. you know, how do I know it's not going to be John this time who's messed up or mm -hmm. that type of thing, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And encampments, like it. in my mind, every time I see an encampment in Woodstock, there's junk everywhere. Like, yeah. why is that just a? I think personally, my stigma is it's everybody's there on drugs and they don't care. Yeah. Why would it, you know, if there are people that are choosing to live there, why would they where they have a garbage can to put stuff in? But they always seem like they're just a, a mess, which society says, you know, let's get rid of this encampment when it's obviously needed. That's what they've chosen. But why is it like that? I think that we forget that people are often quite transient, so they're not necessarily in these encampments for a long time, so I think that's part of it. I also think that um, when you don't have a lot, everything means everything to you, right? And so we're keeping things that maybe to us, we're like, what is the purpose of this? But to them, it's it's really, really important. Um, and then when your basic needs aren't being met, maybe the, the your the organization of your space is just not the top priority and instead it's you know where am I going to get my next meal or where am I going to sleep tonight you know the encampments aren't always the safest places um, we recognize that and the people in them recognize that as well so I think those are all contributing factors and I think it's really important to mention that you know for the most part encampments are relatively new most municipalities are if you've been large enough you've got a plan I know in in Woodstock uh, being part of the ERT team there uh, they have made massive Massive strides. You know, we've had cleaning companies come in and clean them up, but we're also recognizing great that you said just put it in the garbage. 
where you know like uh, and it, that's typically what happens is they're bringing you know their belongings out there and then either something's happening in the night and they have to vacate um, so what we've done is we've actually partnered the city of Woodstock through the mayor's task force which has been absolutely incredible um, has really identified the issues so now we allow them to put their garbage out in certain sections and we do pick it up uh, as a preventative measure and with the amount of teams that are going to the encampments on a regular basis it's allowing us to also monitor that we now give them garbage bags um, but you, we also have to realize there's some safety pieces to that um, so are we get, making sure that it's the right um, garbage that's going in there and then we do provide teams that will that go through and do a large cleanup with the guests there there is no need to go in and throw out everybody's most valuable possessions um, so it needs to be done in a very dignified uh, and kind manner so we give them I think it's eight days warning uh, or something like that that the team's coming in and then each visit we're leaving garbage bags and gloves and making sure people have the opportunity to do the work because uh, the reality is they actually want to help clean up they don't want to live like that they just don't have the resources garbage bags are expensive garbage cans are expensive um, so w again thanks to the the mayor's task force and Woodstock that's one unique model that seems to be working very very well and just to add to that too, first I want to thank you for um, for vocalizing what your personal stigma is because mm -hmm. that also isn't easy. So yeah. thank you. Um, and second, just to add to Sean's too, it's it's more than you know the access to. I think about bag tags. Like we're paying two dollars a bag tag. Mm -hmm. So also when we're on the street, we hear from you know some of our individuals who are housed. But again, this is a piece of eviction prevention. Is we have the garbage in our apartment and we don't have the money for a bag tag. So they might have you know three four five 14 bags of garbage um, because they don't have the two dollars to put it out weekly mm -hmm. so one of those things that again you you know um, you and I might just take for granted we have it in our drawer every week we throw in our in a, on our bag and toss it out by our curb and away we go that that's unfortunately hindering on their very limited budget yeah a lady in London that um, and her homeless shelter uh, got burnt yesterday. We smoke detectors work in their encampments. Are we able to provide that with that work? Because no. that was a shame to say that yeah. a homeless person has yeah. severe burn. She's hospitalized. So the question was. Um, you know, is there outdoor uh, smoke detector devices? So I've been working with the Woodstock Fire Department. Unfortunately, at this point, there is not a device that works with extreme weather conditions, specifically with freezing conditions or wet snow or rain. Um, we do have the fire department going out and we are providing them with uh, fire extinguishers that are safe and pails of water as well um, that they can utilize and they are replenished. It, it can't be one-time pieces so they are all services have been connected to this ERT team and it's working incredibly well because we've not only connected from a standpoint of helping guests in the encampments we've also connected as a collaboration of resources to notify people that are using the services such as parks and rec you know when they're in their trucks and they're at the you know park they see a new encampment we're able to now map it so I can log in and see where is an act where is an active encampment, and if they come across a new one, they pin it, and then everyone on the team gets an email. So, some great questions, but unfortunately at this point, and I did see that yesterday, incredibly sad. Yeah. Are there any other? Yes. Um, I don't think money is going to solve the problem here exactly, but all we've talked about tonight is money, mm -hmm. and I just wondered if I was planning to solve the problem um, I'd want a certain amount of information about how much it's going to cost to solve mm -hmm. the problem I just wondered whose responsibility it is in our county to formulate a plan or do estimating on that kind of thing and whose responsibility it is to actually tackle the problem I see private groups and you know volunteers doing a lot of work and it's very commendable but I just wonder who's supposed to solve this oh I'll take that last piece for sure um, so the question was about money and that's sort of what you've heard about tonight and you know how are we going to solve this issue I can tell you emphatically there is no resolution right now 
Um, if, if there was a resolution, my gosh, I, and I was the one that brought the table, I'd be able, I wouldn't be in Tilsonburg tonight. Um, however, the reality is that it's people that's going to change this problem. But everyone deserves to get paid to do that work. That is really the lion's share of, of the funding that's afforded is all through wages. When you look at the responsibility piece, a portion of it falls to the County of Oxford, sorry Mr. Mayberry, um, but also a reality that there are incredible teams doing this work every day. And we are working hard to look to those small wins or those small resolutions to create that opportunity. But is there a, a magic bullet right now? No. And I think the numbers and the increased numbers that we're all feeling, um, I don't know any group that's not at capacity. Really, you know, when I look at, at our our teams and what we're going through, we are all busting at the seams. I thought that having a day space that could hold 55 people would be more than enough. It's not even close. And uh, but when it comes to how we're going to solve this, it's going to be through people creating unique solutions for unique, complex individuals that we see and come through our doors each and every day. So Sean, you have, uh, you were just asked a question earlier about the perfect building. So you might be able to start something new here. You, <laughs> you come up with a plan that what this perfect building is and all the agencies that offer, because like you said before, we're going here, we're going here, we're going here, we're going, and you don't, we're, you know, it's so confusing for everyone, everybody's yeah. there. Maybe that's a cost saving. So why don't you work on a plan that, yeah. Oxford County is going to be a leader in Ontario or Canada. Boy, oh boy, am I glad for this question. Um, I made a presentation in September emphatically that said we do not need to spend $125,000 to have a company come from an outside source to tell us what our problems are with a hope that it's going to be even remotely different than any other community across Ontario, Canada, or North America. I think that there was, there is and there should be a localized plan. Um, when I look at how hard I have to fight to get every penny with the County of Oxford and from our incredibly uh, generous donors, I think that we need to start utilizing our frontline workers who know our guests, who know the complexities. There isn't, uh, there is a reality that some people think it will just be, you know, groups bargaining for the same dollars for me. The plan really is in motion. I've laid the plan out. They didn't love my plan, and so they've gone a different route. And uh, um, you know, I am not. I am unapologetically not okay with it. Um, and I will always voice our opinion that we have the resources here to create the, a unique solution. Um, unfortunately, it's not the table that I sit at that makes that decision. Mm -hmm. But I guess, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier, like the mix too, right, to your question, like the mix of the emergency needs plus the kind of longer term housing. Um, and so that's why, like you said, there's no, there's no silver bullet, which is the unfortunate part, but it's trying to figure out those unique solutions that Sean mentioned. I keep reading in the uh, London Free Press about this gentleman who donated a fairly large sum of money to mm -hmm. the council to solve the problem. They haven't solved it. They're still oh. fighting. They don't know how to spend it. Yeah. And everybody's upset and at each other's throat. So, as you say, you've got to start at the bottom. And I worked in healthcare for over yes. 50 years. And we argued for years. Mm -hmm. Start at the bottom. <laughs> we know what the system needs. Not these guys right. that are up there getting paid millions of dollars yeah. and haven't got a clue what the frontline people are dealing with on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I've been yelling for years and nobody's listening. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your comments because you're absolutely bang on. So my question, sir, is uh, you said you don't have the answer to it because people are stopping you. Mm -hmm. So what is it, lo levels of government? Yep. And how does the common audience mm -hmm. encourage them to make a 
more readily available to services? <laughs> um, another really great question, but I will uh, not enter my political warfare uh, as we're as we're here this evening. But I, I honestly will, you know, I say this because I am uniquely well, positioned in my you. director to work with these individuals who are incredible um, and I feel like we do have an opportunity for a, a great stepping stone I won't say it's a solution um, but what are the barriers that we face bar none um, it's when politicians become the experts that's what the problem is and we should all be a little weary of that I think that you know when I look at the amazing work that Abby does and Amanda does and and Stephanie does and everyone from community uh, from CMHA you know it's like we come to the table without the resources we come to the table saying we know where the deficiencies are but it's again it's not a glossy report it doesn't look fancy <laughs> But I am a huge proponent of well, you've got to start somewhere because doing what we're doing just isn't working. So let's bring the realities of the work to the forefront with those that are doing the work in Oxford County. So are they actually doing what you just said about the 125,000 bringing someone in? They are bringing someone in and paying them to. That is 100 percent yes. They are. They are. They voted in favor. Uh, of doing that and I'm not sure at what meeting um, I believe I spoke at the September 29th meeting um, and spoke heavily against it um, and uh, again I my opinion is not the only opinion I'm sure Stephanie has as a different voice on that and I'm okay with that um, but again I, being on the front line is very different than looking at advocacy and statistics which is vitally important as well please don't take it away but my goodness, we have a chance to do something unique in Oxford County. And I'm, at this point, I'm not sure we're being utilized in the, the best way to do that. Sorry for my honesty. <laughs> no, it's good. And I think something I would add to, and um, so part of with the Oxford Housing Action Collaborative, um, we have been developing um, calls to action. So in addition to some of the stuff Sean's talking about, there are also other pieces, and that's what we're trying to get at, there's not just one answer, right? There's multiple pieces. So part of that um, calls to action is stuff like crisis stabilization beds. So um, if you are someone that needs actual medical care, uh, a place to crash, they're also term crash beds sometimes, okay. but you need to be supervised by a medical personnel, then that, that's a huge need. There's not spaces in Oxford County um, for crisis stabilization, so people go to, like, there's not the room in the hospital either. So th there's a number of pieces that we are outlining in our calls to action, um, which if you want to, I'm trying to think the way to access them. Um, we do have a website we have to update um, called endhomelessnessoxford.ca. Um, so we are in the process of updating it, but there's lots of information there. It gives you a chance to then kind of familiarize yourself with the potential calls to action and then have those conversations um, with municipal leaders because there's many, many pieces to it, right? Um, in addition to the need for the emergency shelter. How willing are other groups besides your own to working with you and you working with them? Um, I, I don't like to name names, but somebody like the Salvation Army has been helping people for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. They have some expertise yeah. we could be drawing on. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's other groups in the county who are also struggling and trying to do good things. And I know everybody, it's human nature, has an agenda and they like to do it their way. But if we could get past some of that, I think we could do more. Mm -hmm. Agree? Mm -hmm. what, what, are you, what are your suggestions? How can we move forward? Um, I personally feel very fortunate here in Tilsonburg that as service providers, <coughs> excuse me, we work very, very closely together. Um, I think that some of that comes from being a smaller community and having to be more creative. Um, but I know for me, in terms of when I think about St. Vincent de Paul, Helping Hand Food Bank, Salvation Army, Cycles, I mean, that's just to highlight a few. But I would at least have one individual who I could pick up the phone and just have a real conversation of this is the situation of the individual. What 
what can we do to support them together. Um, I think we, as a community, we work really well together. Uh, we have the Tilsonburg Resource Network where a group of providers meet every month and it really is a lot of brainstorming. Heather is the chair of that network. Um, a lot of brainstorming and information sharing. I, I personally feel like we don't work in our silos. I can only speak to Tilsonburg because that's where I'm um, <clears throat> located full time. Brooke, I don't know if you would agree with that, but I, I feel very blessed to work in, in the community with such um, willing providers. Yeah. Can yeah. I add one more thing? Yes. Um, this is off a little bit onto the detox, uh, or having a de detox in Woodstock, and that was rejected. Um, there was a community, I wish I could remember the name of it, out west, a small community too, and they were not granted any um, money, federal money, for a detox. So the town decided to do it themselves, mm -hmm. and um, the, the business people, they all got on board and they mm -hmm. ran one to show the government, well, mm -hmm. you're not going to do it, we can. And I like to think that that's a hope that we all should have to. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of work, I'm sure, but if people say, this is our town, we don't want this to happen mm -hmm. here, this is how it needs to be done, and it can be done well, and they can prove it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I'm just going to follow up on my previous question. If I were a citizen of Oxford County, and I wanted to hold somebody's feet to the fire mm -hmm. over this issue, Whose feet do I hold to the fire? Like, I'm, I know Dave Mayberry sitting over there. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to burn Dave Mayberry. But, and we're not supposed to name people who are here according to Because he wants to be anonymous. But my point is there are people in the community who are social advocates. To be frank, I'm fairly well informed about the community. And I really have no idea who I should be calling. So and I read about it in the paper and I, I read the appeals for money from various organizations that are running you know good things and good programs but it just seems to me that if I was going to throw a bunch of money or find money in the community to put towards something I'm really I'm really confused about what I, what I should put that. so do we have leadership or not I mean is it is it the county's responsibility or is it the town of Tilsonburg or the town of Ingersoll or the city of Woodstock or Southwest Oxford or which municipality do I call? I think part of the problem is that it's a complex problem, so it's a complex solution, and not one place has all of the answers, right? We're looking at mental health and addiction and lack of housing and not enough money, so it's, I, I, I think personally, as somebody who works in it, like, I'm also confused. I don't know who to call either, right? There's no, there's not just a one number, one person who's going to be able to do it all, and that's 100% part of the problem. And also the historical, like, downloading, so if you think of the federal government, the responsibility around the National House strategy and then they set policy and they have different programs and they are moving forward on some things but then they then download to the province the province downloads to the municipality right so it's I think it, it's that's what makes it confusing on top of everything because each partner holds pieces of the policy puzzle so for example my rant my normal rant right now that I'm really stuck on from an advocacy perspective is around vacancy I mentioned it a million times vacancy deed control and <coughs> excuse me um, rent control so that is a provincial policy that's had huge 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 implications for people in our community and across the province but the municipality what can they do about that they can try to advocate to the province <coughs> right uh, we can advocate to the province all of us so that's the, the challenge right because you're advocating to all these different levels who have different responsibilities who have different funding pots so I don't think it's one like you said, it's not just one um, group, and so that makes it confusing. Um, the county is our housing service manager, but they don't, they can't do it alone. And so I think that's why the towns are getting involved in the municipalities. That would be my perspective, because they've bought into the strategic plan um, that the county set, which says 100% house, that we're gonna aim for 100% house. So I think we're all kind of bought into it, I think, but then it makes it difficult of where to go. So I don't, that's why I don't think we have an answer per se, because it's really issue-based, which makes it 
frustrating and uh, and it's really I think a historical downloading and there's tons of if for fun if you want to read articles about the downloading and, and all the things that have happened with housing across the years but I think you were going to say something no I was just going to say um, you know at the point that we're at the reality is uh, there is no solution. So holding some one person's feet to the flames, which there are times I would love to. However, I think that we have to be realistic and say, this is really all of our problem, mm -hmm. right? Whether you're a resident or whether you're Mayor Gilvesey or you're David Mayberry or you're Ernie Hardiman, you know, Doug Ford, go on and on. The reality is that we all need to be going and relying on those that hold roles that are far different than what we do as independent residents. You know, I would always start with Mr. Mayberry and, and see the great work that he can provide and with his unlimited resources of reaching out to people. You know, if you're comfortable talking to somebody, start there. Um, but I can be honest, as a frontline service provider, same as we've all said, we don't just have one phone call either because uh, that would be like a bat phone ringing off the hook. So, um, Sorry for being so vague when you've asked some really great questions. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I got my answer. <laughs> yeah. Call the bat, just, but nobody's, nobody's in charge. Yeah. 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 Call the bat line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions before we wrap up today? Okay, well, thank you all again for coming this evening. It's greatly appreciated. And again, stay tuned as we most information about our second and third sessions in the series. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.